Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Today we're going to talk about uh, a, a specific type of uh, removable partial dentures, which we call the temporary type. It's close to what you know because it's made out of acrylic and teeth. So you have the acrylic and you have the teeth replacing areas where patients have edentulous saddles. So it's very similar to what you had in dentures, but what the main difference is having what we call clasps. What are these clasps? These are additional components for the re removable partial denture to aid in the retention. Because in, in contrast with the complete denture, remember that in the complete denture, we had the acrylic covering all of the basal seat area. But here, because we have some of the teeth still remaining, that means we cannot cover the acryl beyond the teeth and we do not get the full support from all of the residual ridge area or the basal seat area that we used to get from the denture. So we will have this type of acryl that is a bit shorter than the borders of the denture, conventional denture. This loss of basal area also follows that we will also lose, it follows that we will also lose the support area and we will lose also the retention that we get and the seal we had in dentures. Remember that dentures took some of the retention by having the acrylic extending and having a seal, a good seal. So all of this is missing, so we have reduced retention. To substitute the retention, we try to put in clasps. So if this is going to go into the patient's mouth, these clasps will wrap the teeth, go around the teeth, and hold the dent partial in place. And once the patient wants to remove them, simply they slip away the clasp from around the teeth and take the denture out. So these are the main retention areas. And this is our subject for today's lab. We are we're going to wire bend these clasps. So it will be the first step. So if I have a cast, I will make my wires first, I will do the bending of the wires, then I'll do the setting of the teeth, and I'll, I will set the teeth and the wax, which will be, uh, become acrylic later on, over the wires that I have bent. So today we're going to explain only the wire bending beneath the other procedure that we do for partial dentures. After this step, we will have similar steps to what we had in dentures. We will do a wax up, stoning, making sure that everything is okay. This is in lab number four, where after we have finished trial in denture, uh, the, uh, in the patient's mouth, we need a trial usually for cases where we have free and sudden to make sure that we have recorded the bite correctly because we might have lost part of the posterior contacts and we want to make sure that our registration of the teeth are correct. So it might be after a try-in. Or we might substitute with not having a try-in visit in the clinic and immediately going to this step if we are sure and we have good and stable occlusal contact on the other side. So it depends and you will get the difference when do we need to register an occlusion in a try-in visit or, uh, and check it in a try-in visit or when we not, do not need it. But say we are in the last uh, lab just after we had approval of our design of the RPD. So we finish the wax up in the form we want and we will do the procedure of flasking and uh, curing of acrylic. And once we take this out of the flask, we will have dentures that are a bit rough and once we finish them and polish them, we will get these partial dentures ready for delivery for the patient. So we see that the clasps that we have bent are now inside the acrylic. It's embedded inside. If you look closely, the wire is embedded. It's in sandwiched between the upper and lower layers of acryl which went around them. Now to make this feature present, which is having the wire exactly inside the acryl, not exposed from this side and not exposed from this side, we need to follow the rules of wire bending for clasps. And these are as follows. Look closely at clasps. We have this 
large design which has a clasp bend around a premolar and the missing area is interior so we are going to see closely the features of wire bending that we have in this area okay so I could divide any clasp into three parts a facial part and this is the one we will see from outside the acryl so this is the facial part we have a proximal part this is embedded inside the acryl and we have a palatal or lingual side depending if it's an upper or lower and also this is embedded inside acryl so also this should be embedded inside acryl so the only thing we see in a completed partial denture is only the facial one okay but these we bend them in a way to make sure that they go inside the acryl and they are not exposed why because stainless steel wire which is the rot wire we're using does not bind chemically to acryl it binds mechanically it's only embedded there by its mechanical retention there is no chemical reaction between the metal and the acryl so any area where we get not embedded in acrylic will be loose and can easily fracture second is the flexibility the wire although the wire is long when we embed it into acrylic up to here we will only get the flexibility of this part of the wire and this is what we need actually we don't need the flexibility of the other areas so if this is exposed the flexibility of the wire will be reduced increased sorry and because the resistance is reduced and the coverage is reduced so we'll get more flexible wire that means the flexibility will get less retention and let's holding to the tool so we want the acrylic embedding up to here so this is why we designed the clasp in a way that we embed these two parts and leave the facial alone okay. now we're going to talk about the features for each part of the clasp the facial the proximal and the lingual or palatal part let's take first the facial we have 10 features for the facial class bending this shape just looking at it as it is it has 10 features so let, let's take them one by one let's look at first of all about around the location of the tip the tip of this uh, part is beneath what we call a survey line let's talk what is a survey line in any tooth we have the teeth that that have a maximum bulge in one area and we have a narrower area around the cervical region so the teeth are not symmetrical they are not one cylinder there are actually two parts we have a bulging part and areas going away from this bulge so a survey line is a line that we draw using an instrument called a surveyor and we'll see it in a moment and we draw by running a pencil over the maximum bulge automatically this pencil from the side of the pencil it will draw a line representing the maximum bulge of the tooth and we call this a survey line now if we want the clasp to hold in place we need to place the tip beneath the survey line to take anchorage so once it's in under this this line it will have a good grip around it and it's similar to cups for example even this cup if we look at this cusp cup if I want to hold this cup in this manner I could hold it why because my finger is engaging in this area beneath its maximum bulge so I could have a good grip on it so we call this retention so it's the same idea about the clasp it should run like this and get its retention from going beneath the survey line now suppose we have the opposite we have a tooth with no survey line or no maximum bulge okay even if I place my clasp here I don't have a grip it will slip away from the tooth because I don't have a, an undercut okay so in our case in this case of a tooth we draw the survey line using the surveyor we'll see it in a moment so we have the serve running the pencil over the maximum bulge have produced this line which we call a survey line and we want to make sure that the tip 
is beneath the survey line. This third of the clasp is beneath the survey line. With throat wires, even if part of the body also is under the survey line, it's okay. But this will not be the case in when we have what we call metal cast clasp. We'll talk about that later. So I need the tip, which is the terminal half of the facial part under the survey line. I also need this part not to be sharp. Do you remember when we used cutters, we produce sharp ends with cutters. So it's better when we finish our procedure to round this out using a disc, a metal finishing disc. The, t the clasp has a curve to it and the curve is exactly fitting on the curve of the tooth. So there is no space between the clasp and the tooth. So we have a total tip of the, uh, a total contact with the tooth. And also, you notice the curve has no bends in it. I, mean, I don't see angles. It's a smooth curve from the beginning till the end. And I also notice that the curve is heading upwards. So the tip, it's going downwards and then upwards. So it's, the curve is curved upwards in terms of the clasp design. So the total contact with the tooth ends in the angle between the facial and the proximal surface of the tooth. Here we end the contact. Here we have space between the clasp and the tooth. Also, although this is beneath the survey line, I also should be away from the gingiva because while this denture is inside the patient's mouth and the patient is biting on it, there will be some minor movement to it. So with this minor movement, if it keeps impinging and pushing on the gingiva, it will cause gingival inflammation. So the wire, although it's beneath the survey line, it also should be away from the gingival margin by one to two millimeters. A length of the clasp should follow the total facial length and ending in the proximal area. It should not end here because suppose the clasp is ending here, while the cheek is moving to the left and right, we will injure the cheek. We'll have injury to the cheek. So it's better to hide the clasp in between the proximal surfaces. Okay, so suppose we are looking at this clasp where it's designed to end up here. When the cheek is moving to the back and forth, it's not scratched by the tip. So it's hidden in the proximal surface. So the length of the clasp should go all the way up to the proximal surface of the tooth. The diameter we use, the wire that we use, are different between premolars and molars. In the wire that I bend around premolars, I can use 0.6 or wire number 6. Around molars, I bend using a 0.7 or number 7, wire number 7, because this distance is smaller, I need a more flexible wire, and 0.6 is more flexible than the 0.7. So around premolars, we bend with a different wire diameter than molars. So these are the features of the clasp here. Proximally, we have five rules for the proximal way this tooth is working. Now, remember that in proximity, we need two things. If, first of all, I need the acryl, the wire to be embedded in acryl, meaning that acryl is going beneath it. And I also want this wire not to interfere with the contact of the tooth, the artificial tooth, with the natural tooth. So I need to bend it in a way to have the following features. First of all, it's away from the contact area. The contact area is where a tooth meets a tooth. Let's look at this side. So a contact area is where a tooth meets a tooth. So if the tooth is missing here, I need this tooth, the missing here, which is in this case a canine, I need it to touch this tooth in the contact area here. And you remember from morphology that the contact areas are closer to the marginal ridge of the, of the occlusal surface. So I need this area exposed. So the wire should not go beyond if it goes beyond this point, the tooth, natural tooth will not come in contact with the artificial tooth. So it should be away from the contact area. It also should be away from the gingival margin. 
Why? Because of the trauma. We don't want a trauma here. And also it should be away from the tooth. So although it's away from the contact area, but I don't make it in this way. Even if I'm releasing the contact area, I don't make it like this. Because if I make it like this and very close to the tooth, how can the acryl embed an inside? There will not be any space between the wire and the tooth. So when I want to put in acrylic, it will not go inside here. So this area will be exposed and it could easily take, go out of the acryl or fracture. So I need to bend it in a way that it goes far away from the tooth, okay? And also far away from the undercut. What is the undercut here present? Once more, remember that when we have extracted teeth, the tooth that is missing occurs between two teeth. And we said that these teeth morphology are that we have a bulge in the tooth and we have an area where we have an undercut. So the undercut is what's away from this bulge. It's beneath it. So if I want to replace exactly what has been lost here, I could think about a tooth with gingiva and let it sit here. This is the artificial tooth I'm coming with. This is a new tooth. I want to put in the partial denture. But can, if this is made of solid acryl, and this is made of solid acryl, remember that we're replacing gingiva by acrylic, solid acryl. And this tooth is solid. If the patient wants to take out the denture and come in, can this denture come in around the teeth when it's solid and the teeth are solid? No, it will not. It cannot go in. And if it goes in, then you cannot take it out because these are solid surfaces in contact with each other. So we need to design our partial denture away from undercuts. How do we do that? By making something called the blocking of the undercuts. So after we do a survey line and before bending our wires, we put some plaster to beneath the survey line and cover this area. We want to exclude these triangles, this dead end triangles because one we want the solid partial denture to come in and out smoothly without engaging these undercuts and what the path that the partial denture follows is called path of insertion it's the same as path of removal but usually you find it in the book as path of insertion so when i have a partial denture and with two missing te teeth here and two it's bounded I want the solid denture to go in and out smoothly without interfering with the teeth. So we do a step called, other than doing a server line, we do a step called blocking proximal undercuts. So this blockage of undercuts, automatically this wire will be away from the undercut because when we, when we bend the wire, we keep it away from the contact and we put it in this location away from the tooth to be sure first of all it's away from the undercut so it will go in and out easily and it's also away from the tooth enough for acrylic to come in and surround it okay so we do what we call a blockage so let's revise the the features of the wire in the proximal area so once more It's away from the contact area, it's away from the gingiva, it's away from the tooth, it's outside of the undercut, and it's curved downwards. If I look at it here, it's curved downwards. Remember that the clasp is curved upwards. This one is curved downwards. Why? Because I want to come closer to the tissue in this side. Okay. We said it's away from the tooth, and... It's curving downwards. The last part of the clasp is the part embedded inside the acryl as well. This will also be embedded inside the acryl and we call it the palatal or the lingual. So if this is the upper, it will run from the proximal surface inside the palatal surface. If it's in the lower, it will run 
from the proximal surface into the lingual area. Okay? So it's lingual or palatal part. But anyway, it's what we call the tag. It's the end part of, or the final part of the clasp. Once more, we want this embedded in acrylic. If it is exposed, it will come, the wire itself will come out easily. It's not bounded to the acrylic. So that's why we also need to make sure that acrylic comes beneath it and holds it firmly. So the features are, it comes close to the gingiva but does not touch it, allowing a space for acryl to come beneath the, the wire. It runs parallel to the surface. Okay. It runs down perpendicular to the teeth surfaces. So the teeth were running like this. It's better to have the wire perpendicular because once it comes perpendicular, it's stronger and it's more retentive. It's away from the tissue. It, 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 the length is more than one and a half centimeters because if it's less than a centimeter, it might be easy to come out. So the more it, length we have, as much as possible, if, definitely more than one centimeter, but beyond one and a half, it's even better. If I can extend it there, the short one might take, come out easily. And it ends in a way where it is retentive and acrylic. So how do I end my wire here? Either by 90 degrees downwards, it goes heads downwards to the tissue. Okay, see this one? It heads downwards to the tissue, touching the tissue here. And this will cause like an angle, so it's anchored inside the acrylic better. Or we end it sometimes like a zigzag. And this will also aid the retention of the wire inside the acrylic. So we said that before we want to do a wire and to observe all of the features of our wire, we need two steps, initial steps. We said we need to draw the survey line on the teeth that we call abutments. And we also need to block out these undercut areas. Now why do we need blockage material? If we look at a natural tooth, unprepared tooth, this is a natural tooth that we might be using for removable partial denture as an abutment. We find that natural teeth come in a way they are convex on all surfaces. They have bulges. They have this morphology, this round half circular morphology in different variations, but usually we have an area of a bulge in the middle and undercuts beneath this bulge. If we look closely here, for example, there is an area here hidden from the camera that was away in the undercut. So you have areas above the undercut and you have areas beneath the undercut and these are hidden. So if I take this as a demonstration or as a model representing this tooth, we find once more that they, we have these convex surfaces. These convex surfaces have a bulge. This bulge goes around the tooth. Now for us to use this undercut, this is a natural occurring undercut, so why not use it? How do we use it in removable partial dentures? We design our partial dentures having a clasps. So these clasps, wire clasps, are supposed to go into these undercuts. And once this clasp goes into the undercut, it will, it will provide us with retention. It will keep the RPD in place, a removable partial denture in place. So the idea of blockage is that some of these undercuts, we utilize them. But there are some other undercuts on the proximal surface we don't want to utilize them. Why? Because if the acrylic, hard acrylic material and hard wire material go into these undercuts from the proximal surface, we're talking from the area f close to the saddle. This is the saddle area where we're placing teeth. Now this material, new material is solid acrylic, upper teeth, solid acrylic in the base area and the wire, which is also not very flexible. So if I want to take it from a model that has these undercuts, I've utilized the buccal, but I have to exclude the proximal and palatal. If I make this partial denture on this cast, I can produce it. But once I go to the patient's mouth to insert it, it does not go in. These solid material will not allow me to go in to the location because they don't go beyond the undercut.
Okay? So this acrylic here is designed to go into the undercuts. It's not excluded. So this is our problem. And this many times we face it in the clinic where the removable partial denture, it looks well, everything is well, the criteria, the morphology, the teeth, the occlusion, everything we design it on the cast very well. But once we want to fit it inside the patient's mouth, it does not go in. Why? Because there is some acrylic going into these proximal undercuts or palatal undercuts sometimes of the teeth. So any undercuts that we did not exclude will pose a problem for us when we go and fit in the denture into the patient's mouth. So what do we do? Before beginning our design of this removable partial denture, we add blockage material. We usually use plaster and we place it in the areas in between the gingiva up to the survey line drawn by the surveyor. Okay, so this blockage material is made out of hard plaster before we begin adding the acrylic layers. So the acrylic will not go into these undercuts. So it will come in and out smoothly into the patient's mouth. Why? Because we did not engage these undercuts. But at the same time, the acrylic is touching the tooth in the survey line areas. So plaster is added to block out palatal undercuts, proximal undercuts, but the undercuts on the buckle, we leave them to utilize them in the wire. So this is why actually we use the blockage material. So if I'm going to put in my wire bending, I usually put my wire around making sure that the wire also is not going into the undercut. So not acrylic. So if I have this wire will be embedded in acrylic. So the first layer of acrylic doesn't go into the undercut. It's solid acrylic. I bend the wire that is away from the tooth for a distant, uh, some distant location. And the acrylic itself is imb also embedding the upper surface of the wire. So the wire is totally embedded inside this acrylic. So that's why we make this clasp away from the blockage material and away, leaving some space for the inner part of acrylic close to it. So if we are faced inside the clinic with this situation where this RPD does not go in, suppose that the technician did not block enough the undercuts. And using pressure indicating paste or using any material that will expose areas of pressure, I find that this acrylic is excessive and I need to trim from it. So now because we have the wire away from the acrylic margin, I am safe to come in with a bear and trim from here. Why? Because acrylic is keeping a distance between the wire and the tooth. So the blockage will allow, first of all, the denture to come in and out easily. If we find this situation happening inside the clinic, we will be able to trim away from the acrylic proximally without jeopardizing the wire or breaking it off. So it's very important that the wire is away from the tooth. How do we achieve these two purposes? We achieve them by an instrument we call a surveyor. A surveyor is an instrument we, you will be using in removable partial denture and we will take uh, the subject in more detail later on when we take the surveying lab. You will take it in more detail. It's a simply an instrument where it holds terminal instruments in a parallel way. Okay? So no matter how much I move it, I'm always having this in a perpendicular axis downwards and anything drawn by this is parallel to anything drawn here, drawn here, drawn here. So I compare parallelism. So it has basic parts. It has a base here and a vertical arm. And then a horizontal arm, some with a, an angle to make it easy to move. And then another vertical arm move, mobile with a spring mounted. And here I have a screw where I can attach different instruments to it. We will take these in details later on. Each instrument we will know its function. But the instrument we will begin with is what we call a 
pencil marker. It's pencil. It comes in a rod shape and it has a sheet to protect it because you know that this rod is fragile, so we don't want it to fracture. If I come close to the cast, which I fixed on the table, I have fixed it hor totally horizontally to the floor, and come with this pencil around, I would find when it comes in contact with the tooth, it will automatically draw a line. Okay? If you notice the line on the tooth itself, and I'm reaching the gingiva, by the way, to make sure that my pencil is over the maximum bulge of the tooth. So what is this line? We call it a survey line. And what is it actually? It represents the maximum bulge of the tooth in this direction. So this is how we draw it. It is the maximum bulge in which direction? Parallel to the floor. So the pencil comes down perpendicular to the tooth and it automatically is touching the maximum bulge of the tooth. And you could see it easier here. So the maximum bulge is touching. The areas of undercut are anything beneath this line. We call it undercut. The teeth that are around the saddle area, we call them abutments. So we survey them all around. We go all around the teeth that are bounding the saddle. So I'm not drawing, actually. I'm just approximating the pencil. And the maximum bulge touching the pencil is the one drawing. So automatically it draws. So I finish these. I could go to the other side. The last abutment. And I draw my lines. So this is called drawing the survey line. And this, this is the first step we do on this cast. What cast are we using? Is this the primary? Is this the secondary? Well, in acrylic partial dentures, we usually have one impression taken and we can immediately put it into stone. If I think we have a large free in saddle area, no, we could take a primary cast and then a secondary cast and we survey the secondary cast. Okay? So it's your decision. Do I need to really record the borders? If I need very accurate border recording, I need a primary cast, a special tray, and then a secondary cast. If I have a small free in saddle and I could take this easily, record it without specific tray, I could use the stock tray to record it, I immediately take one impression and immediately work with it on stone. So it's all immediately made into stone. So it's, yes, the first impression, but it is poured in stone. So this is the survey line it's drawn. Why do I need the survey line to be drawn? Remember that I want to make sure when I'm making the clasp, I want the lower half of it, the last half of the clasp, in under the survey line. So I need to make sure that when I'm bending a wire here, for example, I put it into the undercut to get a grip and hold to the tooth, okay? The second step we do is blocking undercuts. We need that partial denture, which is solid, to come in and out easily. We don't want any acryl going into these areas. They will prevent it from going in and out. So how do I make sure I don't go in these areas? Before putting in acrylic, and before even wire bending, we block these areas by plaster. I could do it manually, meaning that I could simply bring a, a mixture of pumice and plaster. I have soaked the cast, so the cast is soaked. And manually, just add a bit of this stone and plaster beneath the survey line. Because remember, the pro survey line proximally represents the area where the contact area is. Why is the tooth bulging in this direction? Because it needs to meet the other tooth. So same here. What is meeting this tooth? The maximum bulge of this tooth is meeting this tooth. So I could do it manually. And just expose the silver line and say it's okay. But ha what happens in this case? 
is that the amount that I added is too much. I added too much material and it's not controlled. Okay? So adding too much material means that acryl will not enter this. I will have only a tooth going inside and a lot of space between the artificial tooth and the original tooth. And this space will be an area for plaque accumulation. So I need to add, but not more than the maximum bulge. What will tell me where I am and to control my addition is the surveyor once more, because I told you that it keeps parallelism. And this li vertical line is perpendicular to the path of insertion. And this is the same path of insertion that the partial will go in and out. I will use this small instrument that I attach. It's called a chisel. It's like a knife edge here. And I go and carve out the excess plaster I added because I only want the plaster added in the undercut only. And I totally uncover all of the other areas. So all excess plaster is removed. I'm left with no plaster beyond the survey line. And I'm preserving some of it on the marginal gingiva and just removing the excess. So the final result of the plaster, let me just the plaster is covering all undercuts. So this is the added material. I also add to the other two abutments in the same manner. I'm just going to add here to the other bounded saddle from the same mix. We add a small amount, covering the proximal surface totally, covering the marginal gingiva as well. And then we carve away using the chisel, the sharp end of the chisel, we carve away any excess of plaster material other than that inside the undercut. And I make sure I'm touching the survey line. I want to expose the silver line, which represents the contact area. Okay. So now, when I'm bending the wire, the wire is away from the undercut, definitely. And also, I need to make sure that it's away from the plaster. So the wire itself, when I'm going to bend it, it will be somewhere in here, in location. So it's away from the contact area. It's away from the gingiva and it's away even from the blockage material. So it's somewhere here where I'm going to bend it to make sure that acrylic is there, can go inside and touch the tooth. Okay. So these are the first two steps you will be doing before we begin the demo for wire bending. You can begin working now. Please note that to save time, not to change instruments in between surveyors. You will have one surveyor or in the lab with a pencil attached to it to draw the survey line. And you will have another surveyor where a chisel is attached to it. So make sure that you can use your time wisely. And uh, please preserve that each student is using the surveyor not more than three to five minutes to allow other students also to use it. You may begin working under the supervision of your supervisors now.